I'm Erin Towler, and as part of the Climate and Weather Extremes tutorial, I'm going to be presenting now on analyzing extreme events using extreme value theory. In the previously recorded State of the Science lecture on extremes, we learned that there's no exact definition of an extreme. We pointed out there's two main ways to define climate extremes. The second being extreme value theory, which is for the more extreme extremes, as we might say. And these need extreme value theory because of sampling issues, which is typically less than one to 5% of the total sample. The nice thing about EVT is it can be used to estimate probabilities of values that have not been seen before. Also, in the statistical downscaling lecture, we learned about statistical models commonly used for perfect prognosis downscaling. One of those was extreme value statistics, which we'll be talking about more in this lecture. First, I want to point out several very good resources to learn more about extreme value theory. One is the Cole's 2001 book on an introduction to statistical modeling of extreme values. And another is a paper by Eric Gilland and Katz uh, on Extremes 2.0, which is an extreme value analysis package in R, which is a really useful tool for examining extremes. Before we get started, we want to think a little bit about data. First, it's always important to check our data. Is it really an extreme? So for example, because many extremes rely on observations, there might be observational errors, things like extremes always on the first or last of a month. That could mean that a rain gauge isn't checked until the very first of the month or last of the month. Always rains on a Monday might mean that no one checked the rain gauge all the way over the weekend. So these are just some things to keep in mind. Over here, we see a picture of precipitation trends over the United Kingdom, and we can see one of them has a much different trend than the others. So these are things to keep in mind as we're examining our data quality. Oftentimes, we'll look at a particular rainfall station. These are maximum annual precipitation observations for Boulder, Colorado station. All of a sudden, you can see there's pretty consistent annual maximas until 2013. This does make us ask the question, is this an error or could it be an outlier? Well, in this case, no. In 2013, there was a flood in Boulder that had much greater precipitation than had been seen before at this location. Nevertheless, if we look at rainfall observations from nearby stations, uh, places like Fort Collins and other places that had, have experienced more extreme rainfall, we can see some context. And that while this is unusual for the Boulder Station, it's not that unusual or even the most extreme scene for other nearby stations. I will point out that in regionalized frequency analysis, which is often used for flood frequency analysis, nearby observations can be used to augment an individual station's record. There are two main approaches to analyzing extremes. One is to use the block maxima, and two is to use peaks over threshold. Block maxima approach extracts maximum values for a given time block. For example, from every month, every season, or every year. So again, this shows us um, those boulder, from the boulder station where in 2013, we had a very high value. Block maxima data can be fit using the generalized extreme value distribution or the GEV, which has three fitted parameters. First, the location parameter mu where the distribution is centered. Second, the scale parameter, which shows the spread of the distribution. And third, the shape parameter, which gives the behavior of the distribution tail. The shape parameter is pretty important in extreme value theory because it determines the three types of GEV distributions, which are shown here. There's the Weibull, which is the bounded upper tail, where the shape parameter is less than zero. The Gumbel, which is the light tail, where the shape parameter is approximately zero, and the Frechet, which is the heavy tail, where the shape parameter is greater than zero. 
in general, the different shape parameters can uh, often be fit to different variables. For example, the Weibel type, the negative shape parameter and bounded upper tail is often used for, or is often fitted to temperature, wind speeds, or sea level. The Gumbel type with a zero shape parameter and a light upper tail is the domain of attraction for the exponential family. And the Frechet type, the positive shape parameter, or the heavy upper tail, often is fit to precipitation, stream flow, or economic damages. The GEV can be used to obtain return levels as well as confident intervals. So these are the estimated return period. And you can see that there is that outlier. It doesn't fit within uh, the confidence intervals that would be expected. Peak over threshold or POT on the other hand extracts values above a high threshold. So here you can see that we've drawn in uh, a threshold and selected the data above it. So the advantage of this is that it considers more extremes per time block. So what if you had a very extreme value in April and October, say, of the same year? This wouldn't, say, waste that data like a block maximum approach would, where you'd only get one of them. Uh, but the disadvantage is that it does need to, you do need to select a threshold, and that's subjective. Um, although often you can use it if there's an impact above a certain threshold, a threshold that is related to an impact, but still it's subjective. Um, and also data may be temporally clustered or not independent. Um, so again, let's say even in the Boulder flood that rainfall occurred over several days, you might end up getting two days in a row and we wouldn't allow that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So the POT data can be fit using the generalized Pareto or GP distribution, which is analogous to the GEB. So here we have to select our threshold U and we have two model parameters. We have the scale parameter, which gives us the spread of the distribution and the shape parameter, which also gives us the behavior of the distribution tail. There's also three types as for the GEV. We have the Pareto, which is the heavy tail, the exponential, which is the light tail, and the beta, which is the bounded upper tail. The threshold selection is a challenge because it's a trade-off between bias and variance. Higher threshold gives better GP approximation. You get a lower bias, but less values, which means you have higher variance. Or you can have a lower threshold, which will improve confidence, but we have higher bias. Uh, the real problem is that there's really no automation procedure for this. It's really a lot of trial and error. However, there is some guidance. Threshold selection can be guided where the GP parameter estimates stabilize. So you need to check for parameter stability for changing the threshold. So you can see here on the x-axis, as we change the threshold, it starts to stabilize, say around nine or 10 here, and similarly around nine or 10 here. But the ultimate decision is subjective and requires trial and error. An assumption on the GP is that the data are independent, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but of course, this is often violated by climate and weather data. So one thing that needs to be done is there needs to be a removal of dependence and exceedances by using a declustering method. And to see if it's clustered, we can have an extremal index. If theta is equal to one, there's no clustering. And if it's less than, than one, there's a mean cluster size of one divided by theta. This can be checked. So to summarize the GEV versus the GP, the GEV uses a single value per time block. It can assume independence because we've only selected one per year or per time block. And we get a direct, direct estimation of frequency and intensity. From the generalized Pareto, uh, it doesn't ignore other maxima in the time block, but clustered data can cause problems. Um, it only estimates intensity unless combined with the Poisson distribution for the point process. And we had talked about the Poisson previously in our statistical downscaling. It would be a similar application here. Also, the models need to be evaluated. So the model fit can be tested using objective criteria, such as the AIC or Anakay information criteria, 
There's also the deviance statistic and the negative log likelihood. The formulations for these are in the Gilland and Katz paper that I talked about earlier, as well as in the Coles book. It also relies a lot on diagnostic plots, which again can be subjective, but we can look at quantile quantile plots to see how they do. And we can check the significance of nested models using a likelihood ratio test. Importantly, to account for non-stationarity, the parameters can vary with covariates or predictors. So again, now we're seeing connections with what we had talked about in the statistical downscaling. So here in the GEV, we have this parameter mu. And if mu is varying with time, we can add a linear trend to it. Or this could be really anything. It could be um, ENSO, or it could be another predictor that has a physical meaning for the extremes. Similarly, we could do the same for the shape parameter, or sorry, the scale parameter, but that's a little less like, that's a little less intuitive. Um, so again, incorporating covariates can be used for downscaling and some examples I sort of mentioned before, but listed here, atmospheric drivers, ENSO, PDO, NAO, um, or trends, maybe urbanization or just general climate like temperature trends or the seasonal cycle. Uh, to give an example of this, in this paper listed here, uh, looking over Europe, we saw how mu varied with the NAO for hot spells. To summarize, we have a couple of key points. First, extremes are rare by definition. So pooling with near nearby data can augment a record or provide context, but we also wanna be sure to check our data quality and that it's a real event and not due to observational errors. There are two main approaches to examining extremes using the statistical framework of extreme value theory. We can fit the block maxima with GEV, or we can fit peaks over threshold with GP, and each has advantages and disadvantages. Finally, EVT can incorporate covariates to account for climate variability um, that affects extremes. Thank you for listening, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions.